Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, August 6, 2024 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Jan today wrote up a, well, pretty annoying obfuscation technique that he came across in some malware that ended up installing Remco's RAT. This malware was a Visual Basic script attachment, and it obfuscated the code by essentially having multiple code snippets defining the same particular function. Many of them were in comments, and really the intent was more just to confuse the analyst as to which function would actually be used. The last incarnation of the particular function was the one that was actually then being used and allowed Jan to reverse the code, which then led to a base64 encoded script that did the actual download and install. And well, the CrowdStrike bug is not letting go. We now have a new detailed analysis of the actual problem in CrowdStrike and the related rule files. This analysis comes from a user who identifies himself as security guest on Chinese blogging site QQ. And the it asserts that this is actually an exploitable vulnerability. And it sort of makes sense if you think about it. Uh, there is code being executed in the kernel, which is the highest privilege possible. And uh, the blue screen was basically a bug that was triggered by rule files that were downloaded across the internet as regular updates. So if an attacker is able uh, to inject malicious rule files, at the very least, they should be able to blue screen and very likely they are able to then also execute code by sending the right malformed rule. Well, it turns out that actually the injection part is a little bit easier than it should be. These files are not digitally signed. Remember yesterday I talked about the evil crate problem that you need to sign your updates in particular if they lead to code execution like in this case and uh, the actual source of uh, the update is somewhat malleable uh, because an attacker uh, could just define local in explorer proxy policies which will then point to a proxy that can serve uh, these files because CrowdStrike's download agent will actually follow any local proxy configuration. And that basically gives you the machine in the middle part that would allow you to inject a malicious configuration. Interesting problem. I'm not sure if uh, this has been addressed with some of the work that CrowdStrike has been doing since uh, the issue arose. But of course, this would be an update to CrowdStrike's software, not just a simple rule update. And we also got an update uh, to OFBIS. I wrote about the exploitation attempts against an older vulnerability uh, last week. David uh, Forsyth, who also uses the handle SirXDF, did uh, point out that actually the initial patch for uh, this particular vulnerability uh, didn't uh, fully address it. He put out a nice YouTube video I'll link to that actually shows how the exploitation works for this vulnerability. So a great little insight here on the offensive end. And then we have a new update that was just released that fixes another access control a bypass vulnerability in OFBIS, in particular around this program export and also the entity SQL processor uh, function. The program export was the part that actually was then exploited as part of the scans that I observed and led to the remote code execution. And well, since we are here at my favorite topic, and that's unprotected web application, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, they're of course a web application that's uh, being used uh, to experiment uh, with Python code. Well, if you expose them to the world and you don't protect them, don't be surprised if someone else is executing arbitrary code using uh, these uh, tools. The latest example was documented by Aqua, the only thing the attacker actually did here was to download some kind of Minecraft denial of service package. 
And then we have uh, Patches for the webmail system around Cube. And uh, this is, well, some people may say, just a cross-site scripting vulnerability, but in particular in webmail systems, they are first of all difficult to avoid and with that somewhat common, but also quite exploitable in the sense that, well, uh, you will receive email from various people and you don't always know where they come from. Plus, of course, once you have cross-site scripting, an attacker at least gains access to anything the webmail application has access to. So really difficult for a developer here to properly separate the HTML in the email and the HTML of the actual web application that uh, does display the email. And a particular juicy target here are often government organizations outside of the US. They often don't trust cloud-based webmail providers that are often located in the US. So for example, Similar vulnerabilities in Roundcube have been exploited against a number of organizations in Europe in the past. And this is it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.